Welcome to Cato Weekly Video, hosted by Anastasia Yuglova. Institute for Justice co-founder Clint Bolick, currently with the Goldwater Institute, is author of the new Cato book, David's Hammer, The Case for an Activist Judiciary. This week's episode features some excerpts from his book forum at the Cato Institute. The fact is that judicial activism has become the universal pejorative. In an era of unprecedented partisan bickering, the one thing that brings liberals and conservatives together is the belief, seemingly, that everything that ails America is the fault of the United States Supreme Court. Disdain for judicial activism is so widespread, so visceral, that you would have to be crazy to stand up for it. So why on earth would yours truly appear not only to defend judicial activism, but to argue that the real problem is that courts are not nearly activist enough? The explanation, as I will uh, share with you, is historical, constitution, uh, constitutional, and practical, though I will admit for me it is also psychological born in deeply embedded influences emanating from my childhood, manifested in a name that will forever cast a shadow over my fragile psyche, Weezer. When I was a young boy, I was quite tiny, and from grades kindergarten through second grade, I was terrorized by a schoolyard bully known as Weezer. I don't know whether Weezer had a first name or perhaps Weezer was his first name, but I do remember that for three years, Weezer tormented me daily. Weezer had an enduring impact. First, he instilled in me a lifelong empathy for the underdog, uh, which I have devoted my entire career to, to defending. But I also looked for mechanisms to counter Weezer. Growing up, for example, my best friend was always the biggest kid in class. Ultimately, the experience manifested in my choice of law as a profession. The courtroom is the one forum in which the powerless can lay low the mighty, where David can slay Goliath, hence the title of the book. Some people relax through art or music or golf or yoga. I achieve that sublime state of inner peace by suing bureaucrats. As an adult, I see Weezers everywhere, but nowhere greater in abundance than government. People often go into government for the most noble of reasons, but something along the way transforms them into Weezers. I doubt that growing up, George W. Bush frightened anybody, but as president, he's a Weezer. Ted Kennedy is a Weezer. Bill and Hillary Clinton are the ultimate Weezer couple. Newt Gingrich was a wannabe Weezer. But it is in the dank, dark catacombs of the bureaucracy that the conditions are most ripe for people to give vent to their inner Weezers. Fortunately, the prime architect of our Constitution, James Madison, was a tiny kid too. And he understood this phenomenon keenly. As a result, the Constitution is chock full of mechanisms to check the power of bullies. Most conservatives like Mark Levin couch their complaints about act judicial activism in terms of original intent, and in many instances they have a point. But I find that most conservatives actually adhere to the doctrine of selective intent, especially with regard to federalism. Most conservatives would leave to the states the power to ban abortion, but think it should be a matter of federal constitutional law to define marriage, or for that matter, to determine when a person's feeding tube should be removed, matters quintessentially entrusted to the states. Conservatives would leave to states education policy and speed limits, but not the power to allow states to use, uh, to allow their citizens to use medicinal marijuana. Conservatives find in the First Amendment the right of Boy Scouts not to associate with homosexuals, but not the right of homosexuals freely to associate with one another. Conservatives found it outrageous when federal courts disregarded the will of the Colorado voters to enact restrictions on gay rights, but laudable for federal courts to displace the role of the Florida courts in determining that state's presidential election votes. In a word, conservative objections to judicial activism are hopelessly arbitrary. 
For liberals, opposition to judicial activism is a recent phenomenon, and that is because liberals have become the real judicial conservatives. They have accomplished most of what they want, the New Deal, the Great Society, decades of liberal jurisprudence, and hence have developed newfound affection for such terms as judicial restraint and stare decisis. Thank you for watching Cato Weekly Video. The Cato Institute is a nonprofit organization. For more information or to find out how to give to Cato, please visit www.cato.org.